Hi, welcome to this extended talk on composition with knowledge assumptions. I'm Thomas Kerber, and this is joint work with my co-authors and supervisors, Agalos Kiergas and Nicholas Kohlweiss, who is done at the University of Edinburgh at IDHK. So I want to start a bit with our motivation, and uh, if you've dealt with both knowledge assumptions and compositional systems before, then you're probably already familiar with this. Um, but at the core, these are both two very, very useful uh, concepts. And for knowledge assumptions, they're useful because they often give succinctness where it would otherwise be impossible. Uh, the core idea of knowledge assumptions in many ways is that a short message can uh, imply knowledge of something much larger. And this is something which is quite hard to uh, quite hard to do if you're not making assumptions about it. And in compositional systems, you have a tendency to, to lose p sight of the bigger picture of how cryptographic primitives actually end up being used. And it can be a, a, a large problem if they're used in ways that are not inherently secure, especially if they're interacting perhaps negatively with other cryptographic primitives somewhere else in the system. Uh, perhaps there are shared secrets or shared messages that are being given to both systems, and there are correlations that can be drawn between these. This is something which you want to avoid, and compositional security gives you a very nice way of reasoning about uh, why this does not happen in uh, certain constructions. Now, unfortunately, the two tend to, to conflict, and we've seen in practice that this is because of uh, the reliance on uh, white box extraction in knowledge assumptions for the most part. And I'll get into that in uh, a few slides. But essentially, especially when we've looked at this through the lens of how our ZK SNARKs modeled, um, which was our primary motivation for this work, uh, we ran into two approaches. And the first was um, well, let's make a SNARK protocol more complex and no longer as succinct in order to make it usable in a composable setting. So what's done here is often the witness is encrypted as part of the SNARK proof, and this uh, makes the proof both more expensive because you now need to prove correct encryption, um, and also it makes it longer and not succinct anymore because it contains the witness by definition. The other direction we've seen is an approach of we have composition up to non-interactive zero knowledge and assume that SNARKs do that securely. And this is something that, that many works take and some do this explicitly and say we are going to instantiate this with SNARK um, and we know that that doesn't fit into compositional frameworks but we're going to do it anyway. This is obviously not satisfactory. There's a gap in the security analysis there, and it's a gap that should be filled. So to start with, I'm going to do a very brief recap of both compositional security and of knowledge assumptions to make sure that we're all on the same page. Now, compositional security uh, generally tends to be uh, a, a fairly simple premise, which is you have some uh, protocol of interacting uh, systems on the left hand side. Now they don't need to be interacting, but they, they tend to be. Um, and you want to show that uh, a, a series of interactions with something external, and this is usually um, where it gets its instructions from. So these might be uh, your prove or your verify or encrypt or whatever messages your protocol takes. Uh, these are the external interactions. You want to prove that this is this corresponds to some setting where you've got um, a trusted third party dealing with these, uh, uh, with everything, uh, but with the same message. And this isn't quite the entirety of the story. It gets a little bit more complicated than that, obviously. Um, and one of the things that make this slightly more complicated in a compositional setting uh, is the notion of an adversary. And this notion is more complicated because usually in the uh, real world, we want to give the adversary quite a lot of power. That's denoted here through the dashed interfaces. Uh, and we want to tell, um, we, we want to have them uh, have power over things like what are the exact ciphertexts that are being sent, um, be able to observe all network messages, the, this kind of power, which is a very large attack surface that our trusted third party here 
uh, probably doesn't replicate. Uh, and in fact, it shouldn't. We want uh, the trusted third party to be an ideal of how this should be implemented. And so it would be I ideal if it had a reduced attack surface, uh, one which is secure by definition. So th that's what's usually done. And then uh, in order to have any sense of equivalence, we need to expand this attack surface again. And we need to show that this can be uh, that the larger attack surface can be replicated with it. And that's the task of the, the simulator that gives simulation security its name. Uh, so this simulator interacts with both the reduced attack surface and the larger attack surface that uh, it provides in order to be equivalent with uh, the real world protocol. Now, the only thing that's left there and where the notion of composition really comes in is what does this uh, indistinguishability notion, this equivalence between the two sides mean. Um, and in practice, what's done is a uh, distinguishing environment is used. Now, terminology is a little bit of a, an issue here that the, the two largest um, systems are universal composition and constructive cryptography. And our work uh, follows more on the lines of constructive cryptography just because of its simplicity. Uh, but we are also aware that most people are more familiar with the universal composition terms. So we're going to go in, in with universal composition terms here as well. Um, and this distinguisher is actually the pair of your environment and your adversary. Um, and as, as many people observe in universal composition, you can use the dummy adversary um, without loss of generality. So that's essentially what we're assuming here. We're assuming a dummy adversary uh, where there, your environment is the attacker as well. And so this, um, the, the statement of security is usually one of, you have a set of uh, permitted distinguishers or environments, um, and you say that, well, for any distinguisher in this set, uh, if you connect it up with both your, your protocol on the left-hand side here and with your ideal world consisting of your uh, specification or ideal functionality in UC terms and your uh, simulator, um, if you connect it up with both of these, it's still equivalent. Now, this doesn't quite reduce the problem because you've still got an issue of, well, one is when is one interactive system equivalent to the next? Um, but one thing which you can do very nicely with the set is you can say, well, uh, I, I don't want to have any open interfaces left uh, except for one which outputs a single bit, um, and this bit can be interpreted as a guess of is it in the left-hand side or on the right-hand side. So that is how this is usually phrased, uh, that um, you, you phrase it as a guessing game of the environment is trying to tell which of the two worlds it's in. And if it can't tell, uh, then you have security by definition, because it means that any attack can be translated, uh, any attack against the real system can also be translated into an attack against the ideal specification and that the two behave identically. Now, uh, one thing which this uh, notion affords you is, uh, and this depends a bit on the, the set of permissible distinguishers, that you can freely move uh, things between this set and uh, the protocol or uh, ideal functionality on the uh, on the left or right hand side. Um, and this does depend on the set, in particular, if your uh, set of distinguishing environments is closed under addition and subtraction of these nodes. Um, and it, in the settings of universal composition and uh, constructive cryptography, it is. Um, in our setting, this is a little bit more complex, and I'll get into that in a moment. Uh, but if it is, then then this is what gives you composition for free, because uh, the semantics of the, the whole execution aren't changed by this move. You, you're just reassigning what you're labeling what, um, and it, it means it's still going to be secure for regardless of the, the set of uh, distinguishers on the left and right hand. And yeah, this can be used to both do uh, sequential composition if you absorb simulators in the, into the distinguisher, uh, and it can also be used for parallel composition by just absorbing uh, parts which you're not interested in into the distinguisher or pulling them back out. 
Now, um, I also want to briefly go over knowledge assumptions, and I'm going to work with the example of the algebraic group model, uh, which is a very powerful and very useful knowledge assumption. Now, the, the basic premise is that if you have uh, some algorithm which behaves uh, algebraically, uh, and we'll, we'll get into the constraints of that, the assumption usually is that uh, all algorithms you're interested in, including your attacker and your uh, your environments will, will be algebraic, uh, then if this algorithm outputs a group model, uh, a group element in the algebraic group model, so here it outputs y, then it must know how to construct them from its inputs g and h here. In this case, our, um, our algorithm uh, knows that y is g to the a times h to the b, and this, this should be the case for any algebraic system. Now to make concrete what it means for it to know this, um, we introduce the notion of an extractor, and this also is how you can interact with uh, knowledge assumptions on a practical level. The assumption is that there is an extractor which takes the same inputs as uh, our algorithm. It knows all of the details about the algorithm, including its code and its randomness. Um, and instead of outputting the, the group element, it outputs how this group element can be constructed. So it outputs um, essentially a witness corresponding to uh, the knowledge of this group element. And we call the group elements that are being output here uh, knowledge implying objects in our setting, in the sense that uh, the, the possession of one of these objects implies the knowledge of something further. Um, and we call uh, these representations uh, witnesses in our setting. Now, one of the, the questions we ran into is uh, how do you take this from a setting of where there's a single algorithm and move it to one where suddenly you have uh, complex interacting systems sending messages and large parts of these messages are not going to be group elements, are not going to be knowledge implying objects. Um, and to address this, we introduce a, a rudimentary type system. Now, most of this type system, so everything here in black, uh, is, is just dealing with standard messages. Um, how would you send bit strings? How would you send um, a single bit? Uh, how would you send a field element? These kinds of things. Um, but here in blue uh, highlighted are uh, the parts of this type system which are specifically dealing with knowledge assumptions and specifically given a specific knowledge assumptions and its public parameters, um, which, which is something I will not be going into in this talk, um, we have two additional types of objects. The first is the knowledge implying object. So this would be uh, the group element Y here. And we also have an annotated knowledge implying object. Saying for a given set of inputs, um, with this knowledge implying object, we have a pair uh, of both the object and its witness. So in this case, this would be uh, both of these parts together. Uh, and it's, it's crucial that we have the inputs here because for any, kind of knowledge assumption and not just for the algebraic group model, you can trivially just pass on a knowledge implying object. And that doesn't need to add any information, um, but it's something that you, you can always do. Um, and as a result, you, you need to know what your uh, inputs are to know what witnesses are valid. Um, and the additional typing rules here are just essentially unwrapping this. We say that, well, for whatever kind of um, knowledge implying object we have, there's some internal representation of how uh, how this is actually sent over the wire. Um, and corresponding with uh, these pairs, there's also a representation of the witnesses. Um, and crucially, if we have one of these pairs of knowledge implying objects and witnesses, then these need to satisfy some relation uh, depending also on uh, what inputs you've got. Now, how do we use this in practice? Where would we want to use this in a compositional system? Um, so in practice, we would want to attach, uh, or mainly uh, use extraction in the simulator. Um, so we now, and this is sort of also where this runs into its uh, its issues in standard compositional frameworks, uh, is we also normally want to extract from the distinguishing environment. So we, we want to get more knowledge about the distinguisher, um, and in particular for uh, attacker created uh, objects. Uh, so for example, in the case of non-interactive zero knowledge, we'd like to extract from a 
uh, non-interactive zero knowledge proof that is created from the, uh, by the environment or by the attacker. And this is a problem because um, what that means for your standard notion of extraction is, well, if we want the simulator to extract from, from this part here, uh, it needs to know this part's inputs and this part's randomness and its code, uh, which in a composable setting means we have to give the simulator, which is the ideal world attacker, full access to the entire system. Uh, and that means we have essentially removed all notions of privacy that are possible in our ideal world. We can no longer express privacy properties. That's something that we probably want to avoid. So this is an, a the, the fundamental problem of why you don't have white box extraction in composable settings. And how we get around this is we make it not quite white box. And in particular, um, we give the simulator essentially oracle queries just to uh, this extractor. Uh, and in practice, we do this by lifting our environments into environments which give the simulator access to an oracle that um, allows it to query the extractor. And essentially the way we do that is we assume first off that all of our distinguishers are uh, what we call knowledge respecting, or in the algebraic group model case, would be um, algebraic. And this is crucial because if this is not the case, then we can't extract from it. Uh, so we need to make this as an assumption. Next up, for each of the individual parts of this uh, environment, uh, we transform it into a part which outputs as well the witnesses. So in particular, if we have an original message um, which contains a knowledge implying object and maybe an extra bit of information, we transform this into a message uh, with the extracted pre-applied. Uh, and this message outputs not just the knowledge implying object, but also its witness. So here it's outputting um, that y is g to the a times h to the v. The exact representation of this doesn't really matter. Um, now, this message is not what the recipient at the other end is going to expect. It's going to expect just the knowledge implying object. So we intercept this message um, at the, the midpoint of, of these channels. So we essentially add a new node uh, to this network which does this intercepting. And this node is charged with doing two things. The first is um, parsing out which part of this is the, uh, the interesting part, the, the part with the knowledge implying object and the witness, and sending this to a centralized repository of knowledge, uh, which is just going to record right, this knowledge implying object has this witness. And the second part is it's going to erase this again, replace it just with the knowledge implying object and send that on. And this centralized repository of knowledge is then queryable by the simulator in the ideal world. Now, because there's a, a mismatch in the real world and the ideal world, there's no entity querying it in the real world. We also introduce a node um, which essentially just makes sure the connections are balanced, uh, which exists in both worlds. Now, there's one thing which is uh, still quite important here, and that is we should not let the uh, distinguishing environment itself query the knowledge repository. And it's not immediately obvious why this is the case, but I'm going to um, argue it now. Um, and essentially it's so that we can preserve some notion of composition. Uh, and crucially, Imagine if we wanted to move things out of the uh, distinguisher into the, the, the protocol on the, on the left here. Then one of the consequences of this would be that part of the protocol would be um, providing knowledge implying objects and witnesses to the knowledge repository. Uh, and crucially, while if we do this as, as a single step, it might be the same on, uh, on both sides, in multiple steps, we may have a case where uh, one of the steps has something on its left-hand side that is not on the right-hand side, uh, placing things into the uh, into the uh, knowledge repository. And so there's a, a, essentially a case where it may very well be possible that the knowledge repository will have different contents in the real and ideal worlds, uh, just because of the technicalities of how we have moved things in and out of the distinguisher. And this is something we don't want the distinguishers 
of a different uh, of, of that experiment to be able to set tell. So it's something that could very easily break um, break security statements and make them very brittle if the distinguisher could just uh, say query a non-interactive zero knowledge proof to the knowledge repository and ask was this created in the real protocol or not um, and to prevent that we we explicitly forbid querying of the knowledge repository in both worlds now this has some interesting consequences because it means that um, the simulators cannot immediately be absorbed into uh, into the sets of distinguishers so we, we come up with a uh, slight variant of uh, the, the notation of constructive cryptography. And there, there are various ways in which this differs, um, but essentially we have a calculus that allows for differences in sets of distinguishers. Um, so we no longer need this to be a uh, something that is fixed, and it's something that can vary between uh, statements of security. And in particular, we note that for transitivity, um, this means that you need to be secure with respect also to the simulator of the first step of the transitivity statement when you're doing the second step. Uh, so essentially this forbids negative interaction between simulators um, and same thing goes for uh, parallel composition where we, we forbid negative interaction with the parallel component. Uh, now this has interesting implications for knowledge assumptions, um, specifically because if one of the simulators is actually using the knowledge repository, you can't just easily absorb this into the, into the distinguisher. And uh, the reason for this is uh, quite simply because that would then give the, the distinguisher access to the knowledge repository directly. So uh, one of the interesting things we observed is that this is still going to work fine so long as you have disjoint sets of knowledge assumptions um, for the most part. So if you're uh, doing a, a transitivity step and both steps use different knowledge assumptions, this is fine. You just need to uh, knowledge lift the simulator of the first part. Um, and it's also fine with parallel composition, as long as what you're parallelly composing with is knowledge respecting, um, and you can lift it with respect to uh, the set of knowledge assumptions you're working with. For the most part, this means you're fine, so long as you don't reuse knowledge assumptions across your system. Um, and we also give impossibility results where we show that uh, if you do try to reuse knowledge assumptions, bad things happen. Uh, and specifically, bad things happen because uh, now your simulator uh, can be used to essentially provide the, the distinguishing environment access to the knowledge repository. And this allows it to distinguish uh, what parts are being put into this in the real and ideal world. This happens with the simulator and transitivity, and it happens with the parallel component and parallel composition. Now, finally, we have some concrete results on ZK SNARKs. Um, we give a proof sketch that GROC16 is composable in the algebraic group model. We also take this a step further, and we show that it's still secure um, using special case composition if you're using a uh, setup ceremony for GROC16. Uh, and, and we want to finish this talk with some practical questions. In particular, um, we believe it's understudied which SNARKs are simulation extractable, and we think this is would be something that's valuable to study both for existing and new SNARKs. Um, and we also raise a, an, an open question which this leaves, which is, uh, this is only if knowledge assumptions are not being reused. And in, what we see in practice is that group uh, curve pairs are reused frequently, and we would like to know if this is safe. Um, and it's not obvious to us at this moment. It may very well be that re-randomization guarantees this, uh, but it remains an open question. Now, if you're watching this before the conference, um, please feel to, free to drop into the live session and ask your questions if you have any. Uh, if not, drop an email to me, and thanks for listening to this talk. Uh, it was great having you.